Hi folks, let's talk about return on investment or ROI and how that term is used in the machine shop. This will also be a good intro to Excel or spreadsheets video. Welcome to another chip break. So return on investment. If I invest $100,000 and I earn, in this case, $9,100, the formula is 9,100 that I earned divided by $100,000 means I earned a 9.1% return on that money. Just like if you have a checking account and the bank probably doesn't pay you very much, maybe less than 1%, similar sort of metric. That's not really what return on investment is. Let's build off of that. Let's say we invest $100,000 in a machine. And let's say over the life of that machine, we earn $39,800 off of it. That is in this case, just a made up number. Then when we're done with that machine, we sell it. What does that mean? It means the total return equals the sum of earned, what we earned off of it, plus what we sold off of it. So in other words, we spent $100,000. In the end, we got back $111,800. So the simple return on that would be this, similar to the formula above, which is the 11,800 divided by original investment. I hit equals 11,800 divided by 100,000 means our simple return was 11.8%. That's also not really right because in this example, I said, let's say we earned over the life of the machine. Well, that means usually you have this machine for longer than one year. And generally when we talk about things like ROIs, most people are talking about them on an annualized basis or per year what you earn. So the better way to look at it is this way. Build out a little table here. Year zero or sort of day one, if you will, let's say we write a check for a machine of $100,000. That's a check that we send out. So it's negative $100,000. I, I no longer have that $100,000. Let's say year one, we earn $9,100 off of that machine. Year two, we earn $12,500. Now this is a net number. In other words, this is not the costs uh, associated with running it, but literally the profit off of it. In year three, we really got it humming. We make $14,500 off that machine. At the end of year three, we also sell that machine for, and I just made up this number, 72,500. So if I sum all these up, drag a box over all of them, and it'll tell you in the bottom right corner, the sum of those means my net gain was $8,600. I then can type a formula called IRR. That's internal rate of return. It's easy to get caught up in all of these fancy words, ROI and ROE and, and IRR. Don't get too hung up on that. IRR is a similar to uh, a return on investment. So equals IRR. And I just have to drag my box around these cash flows in uh, Excel or Sheets, or we'll talk about other options, software you can use for free. Well, is smart enough to know that that's about a 3.1% ROI. So why do you care about this number? Hop over to the second tab. We'll put a link to this uh, spreadsheet in the video description. We just bought a VF2. Super exciting. It happened way sooner than I thought. Uh, we only bought our VM3 in, around Thanksgiving, so it's only had it about eight or nine months. I really thought that that machine would last us for a, a few years. Uh, but one, we've grown. And two, I've also learned that modern manufacturing and machine shops really lends itself to one operator running more than one machine. So it's exciting. On the flip side, I really had to put my pencil down and scratch out some numbers and make sure that I could justify this. You're gonna laugh, but this was my dream scenario. This is how I thought through it. We work five days a week. There's 52 weeks in a year. We actually can get that machine running 12 hours a day. We start the shop at six, uh, and I usually will stay till about 5.30, so we can hit cycle start on that last batch of parts. So 12 hours a day. That means my formula here is equal five days a week times 52 weeks a year times 12 hours per day. There's 3120 hours per year. And then let's say 80% of the time during the, that work year, I've got machine that's uh, work that's ready for the machines, whether that's job shop work or products. That means I'm really at 2,500 hours per year. Then let's say when I want to be machining stuff, I'm 90% efficient. So this is spindle on time or making chips. The big biggest thing there would be 
downtime to swap out parts or fixtures or tools. And then let's say $75 an hour, which is not, nothing crazy for a shop rate. Well, that's absurd. That would mean, if this were true, that that machine would generate revenue of $170,000 per year. If this were true, we would all stop what we're doing and buy as many machines as we could because that would be, you know, we'd be uh, doing that and then on the beach for the rest of our lives. So here's my get real scenario. Five days a week, 51 weeks a year. You know, not everybody takes vacation at the same time, but you're going to have some downtime either due to vacation or total machine downtime for maintenance. Seven hours a day because the 12 hours a day, it's just not realistic. You've got to get in at the beginning of the day. You've got to get the machine started, warmed up. This may be a chance where I could push it, but closer to that 12, but I think the 12 was a little aggressive. Let's just say 75% of the time I've got work ready for the machine. Again, I think I can actually do better than that. We'll see. And then 80% efficiency. This is another huge thing. People tend to overestimate uh, favorably all of these things. In other words, they try to they think they're going to be more efficient than they really are. I am going to focus on that. That's one reason why we put a lot of thought into how we're going to tool up and work hold on the new VF2 because I really want it to be fast and quick. If I'm going to invest in this machine, I want it to be able to make parts quickly. A lot more to come on that. And then this $75 per hour, well, that's a kind of a pipe dream. That's more of a what you'd like to bid jobs at. It's the number that you have to use to get enough work to make your ends meet. In other words, if you can bill at $100 an hour and you've got enough work, good for you. If you've got to drop that down based on your capabilities or how well you market yourself, other competition, you've got to drop it down. Let's say 60, which is, I think, starting to get on the lower end if you're talking about good high-end machine work. But the thing is, that number includes a labor component. So that's an operator. And that's not just their hourly rate, but rather what I call the fully baked number. So that's benefits and uh, so forth. Some amount per hour for the other costs, the tooling wear, the maintenance of the machine, the coolant loss, electricity that the machine uses. So then what you're left with is kind of what the machine itself is earning. So that's after you pay for your labor and after you pay for the other thing. So the cash return per hour on the machine is only $20 per hour if I'm trying to bill 60 in this example. What does that mean? Well, if there's 1,339 hours per year in this example, and I'm 80% efficient with that time, and of that time, I'm earning $20 per hour for the machine. That means the machine is earning closer to $21,000, $22,000 per year. My gut tells me that starts to make a little bit more sense based on sort of what what is known as the efficient market theory. Or in other words, again, if everybody could earn $100,000 or $200,000 per year on a 80 or $100,000 machine, there'd be a lot more machine shops out there doing work. So the truth is there's a lot more that goes into it. So how does that factor into how I think about ROI? So the machine itself, the actual VF2, about $83,000. The other stuff, this is very important, $12,500, that's rigging, buying the tools and tool holders, work holding vices, the electric work. So my total cost for that machine, about $95,000. Accuracy here is important. On the flip side, don't get hung up in the last little, you know, 10 or 20 or even $200 invoice. We're going for the big picture here. Now, I have no idea how long we're going to own that machine for, but in this case, let's say six years. At the end of six years, let's say we sell it for about 40% of not the total cost, but rather what we paid for it. In other words, 83,000 times 40%. Maybe that's a little bit low, but things do depreciate. Uh, Does that seem crazy to think a VF2 right now from 2011 would sell for 33 grand? I think that's in the ballpark. I'm inclined to say it could be a hair low. Depends on the machine condition and it depends on how much you've reinvested uh, each year into keeping that machine well maintained. And that kind of comes back to this $10 hour. Are you having Haas come out every year and pull the way covers off and check it? Uh, or are you kind of running the machine into the ground? Those are two extremes I know, but nevertheless. So a similar chart to what we did on the first page right here. I spend 95 grand um, on day one. In this case, I just keep it simple. Let's say I think I can earn the 21,000 each year. And at the end of the last year, I sell it for the 33. There's a cool thing as well. 
building again off of the IRR formula called XIRR. It's uh, we're getting nitpicky, but it can be a little bit more accurate with regard to the actual dates of things. So I'm going to say equals XIRR, and then it wants the cash flow amounts. So I'm just going to drag a box around these all of these numbers. Hit a comma. And now it says it wants the cash flow dates. So these numbers are rather correspond to these dates. So it knows I cut the check on July 6th and the last, I sold it on July 5th of 2023. Hit enter. And that's gonna show me that I earned about a 15% internal rate of return over the life of that machine. So some considerations and why does that matter? First of all, this whole thing this whole calculation of ROI and using Excel in the machine shop, it's garbage in, garbage out. If you put in bad information, it's gonna give you whatever that bad information is processed. So my point here is that people tend to underestimate your expenses, going back to the ROI. My experience, people tend to underestimate things like the tooling costs, the maintenance costs. $10 an hour sounds like a lot, but when you factor in, when you break this out and then you think about, well, let's say over the life of those six years, we do need to do something like swap a spindle out or pull the way covers off or replace something. All of a sudden it can be a little bit more than that hourly rate. People also tend to overestimate uptime. It goes back to the difference between the dream scenario and the get real scenario. That's not to say I can't strive for more, but I think people out the gate tend to think that they're going to earn more and have more uptime or spindle time. This one is one of my favorite points. If you're trying to maximize your ROI, lots of people focus on how much I can earn. Again, that uptime. Other way, it's a fraction though. Not only can I increase the numerator, so in other words, if I can earn more, that's great. But if I wanna increase my ROI, if I can earn more with spending less money on the machine, that has the same effect. And I'm a value guy, I'm a bootstrapper, so if I can buy a machine for 20% less cost that does the same thing, I instantly have a higher ROI. This is how we got started, folks. When we were bought our first Tormach and we were making a product, we had a really low cost machine that was turning out an absurdly high ROI uh, to the point of where you're paying for that machine it over itself in a matter usually of months. In terms of uptime, I'm a big fan of combining both job shop and products. So that kind of goes back to this thing of how much time uh, throughout the year do you have work ready for the machine? Well, if you're a job shop, you may have uh, dry spells, you know, the feast or famine. We've always kind of balanced having job shop work and our own products. So if the job shop work slows up, we can go ahead and build some inventory of our own products. So what does this whole formula do? It helps take the emotional process. Buying a machine, making that investment can be incredibly emotional, both highs and lows. Looking at it objectively, starting to lay down some numbers, even if they're not right at first, can help you think about, should I buy this machine? Should I buy it now? Uh, or even just in terms of I'm buying this machine to think about as an entrepreneur, bringing a product to market, or if I'm a job shop and I think I have the opportunity to earn some repeating work, what's that going to look like? Because there's one thing that's true about these numbers, they are all wrong. There's no way I'm going to earn exactly this amount. The idea is directionally, this this puts a, a collared range. It's kind of like, I should be able to do this much. If it goes a little worse, it may do worse. There may be some room to improve on it. If the ROI is too low, don't do it. From a very, very broad standpoint, one of the reasons we look at ROI is relative investment. U.S. Treasuries, these are the bonds that our government sells. You can buy a 10-year U.S. Treasury. It's varied between you know two and 4% uh, in the last you know, decade. So, that's, that's viewed as a riskless security. In other words, there's a 100% chance, uh, this is how the markets view it at least, there's a 100% chance if I give the U.S. government $10,000 that I'm going to get from them not only my money back, but a return of you know, 2 3 4% on that money, period. It's viewed as the safest investment in the world. So if you're going to go make a, a, a risky investment like buying a machine tool and banking on your ability to generate profit off of it, you need to earn a higher ROI. In other words, you need to be paid for that additional risk. The riskier the proposition is, the higher the return you should look for. 
And then finally, ROI is not just something you should do when you buy the machine. It's something that you can do and come back at and look at and say, hey, after the first year, was I able to earn this much money? Am I meeting sort of my budget or my goal? Am I being realistic? And that can help you do a better job of calculating the next purchase or your next investment. And it can help you understand, hey, if I think if we're growing, I'm going to need a third machine or a fourth machine or a different machine. How quick am I going to have the cash to do that? Well, you've seen our video on budgeting. I love budgets. I also think that they have some major holes or flaws in them. This is just another tool in the toolbox to think about, well, in six months, I ought to have this much cash or this much revenue that can help me understand how I can grow this business and where I can take it. So folks, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned. Take care. See you soon.